and welcome to episode 70 of This Week in Germany. We'll be bringing the world to Germany and Germany to the world with news for the week beginning the 4th of May 2015. My name is Daniel. And I am Felix, standing in for Warp for three episodes. Each week we feature stories from news, society and culture in the English language. If you want to find out more, including ways to follow us on Facebook and Twitter, head over to thisweekingermany.de. Yes, we're on episode 70. Uh, we're in the age of a grandmother now, I think. Uh, it's very it's very nice to be aged 70. Anyway, for our 70th episode, we have Felix. Hello, Felix. Welcome to This Week in Germany. Hello, and thanks for welcoming me. What are you doing here? Well, I guess I'm replacing Warp, and I'm pretty happy about it. Well, not permanently, we should say. Well, unfortunately, no. I think he's gone for three weeks, and this gives me three episodes with you. Yes, he is on holiday with his family in the USA, visiting the rest of his family. So that's very nice. Good for him. And while he's sunning it up in the USA, <laughs> we're here working hard to bring a podcast to you. And it's an extra special episode this week. And do you know why, Felix? I actually don't. I think you do, but you didn't know I was going to say it in this way. That's true. It's our first episode on Detector FM. Oh, So yeah, we have yeah. a... Yeah, yeah. You were pretty excited about this. I think you might have listened to Detector FM before, In fact, right? today I met someone else who is uh, in this new Detector FM program pushing podcasters. I met Holger Klein. Seriously, today. Oh, great. Yeah, he's a major podcaster in the German podcasting scene. He is. Well, Detector FM is a radio station based in Leipzig, which you can listen to online. Just go to detector.fm. And every Tuesday evening, you'll be able to hear This Week in Germany there. So that's great. So they get extra content. We get more listeners. It's a nice partnership. And now we can say we're on FM, which is mm, the real radio, well, isn't it? Well, we're not because Detector FM is actually an online radio station. But... It's sounds nice that they have FM in the name like the because it's it's sound it's well, it is real, Felix. How dare you say it isn't? It I is know. real radio. Honestly, come on, as podcasters, the real FM stuff, it's on its way out. I mean, we are cool. We are podcasters. Exactly. Exactly. I entirely agree with See? you. Um how did you spend spend your May Day this week? Well, in fact, I was on the three day podcaster workshop in Berlin. That's where I also met Holger. And I haven't Actually, I haven't seen much sun. We were all indoors uh, going from one presentation to the next, and I made really good connections. Oh, did you? That's very, very good. Very good. Well, we'll be mentioning May Day a little later on in the program uh, to, to talk about the 1st of May, International Workers' Day. A lot happens in Germany on that day, and we'll talk about that a little bit later in the news in brief. But as for now, let's start with our top story this week it was revealed that the German Foreign Intelligence Service helped the United States to spy on France. The Bundesnachrichtendienst, or BND, was accused of using its Bad Eiblingen, I'm sorry, Bad Eibling listening station in Bavaria to monitor the French Presidential Palace and the EU Commission in Brussels. The listening station sent some of the data gathered to the NSA. So what exactly did they do at this Bad Eibling station? They collected metadata on a variety of targets that they wanted to listen to. And the information that we know so far is that high-level French officials, the French presidential palace and the EU commission in Brussels were all targeted. Now, Bild Zeitung came up with a report recently which said it wasn't just metadata. Metadata, by the way is the information which describes who you're messaging, who you're calling, but doesn't contain the actual content of those calls. Well, Bild said, no, actually, in some cases, email content and call content was also gathered. And wasn't it that the NSA actually gave selectors, I think they call it, to the German spy agency to say what they were actually looking for and where, and then the Germans just, just executed it? Yeah, that's a good way of describing it. So it wasn't a wholesale NSA had entire control of a German listening station, but they sent search requests, essentially, selectors, as they're known. And do we know yet how much data they gathered? A story has emerged, which was uncovered by Spiegel, 
and which is a news magazine in Germany, they say that the Bundesnachrichtendienst deleted 12,000 requests from the NSA from their database in August 2013. So a worker at the Bundesnachrichtendienst discovered this batch of selectors and asked his manager what to do, and he was told to delete them. And so we know so far about the the, the 12,000 search requests, but there could be many more. And is there any any other casualties known? Like, what else were they going for, do you know? Well, apart from these high-level political targets, Airbus has now stepped in. The major aeroplane manufacturer based in France has stepped in to um, basically to find out more information from the German government and potentially sue the German government over industrial espionage charges. They believe that they could have been spied upon so that the German government and maybe even the NSA in the end could find out the um, industrial secrets, the trade secrets of the airplane manufacturer. That's an interesting way the story comes back to the Germans because actually, as far as I know, Airbus is a pan-European project. It's, you know, it's based in France, but it's not it's just a French thing. So if German industry sues Germany over helping foreign powers to spy on them, that's, that would be a big deal. Well, it's complicated. So who knows what part of some kind of Airbus project was managed by France, which Germany wanted to see into. We, we, we really can't speculate as to uh, what suspicions Airbus might have specifically. And I think Airbus themselves want to find out um, from Germany what information that they may have gathered, if they have. And the attorney general in Germany is investigating currently whether there is... Uh, reason to suspect a crime has taken place, a federal crime. And Gregor Gysi, who is the leader of the political party Die Linke in the Bundestag, says that the spy agency's action, um, the actions were treason. Hmm, interesting. But he's also known for good political speeches. So <laughs> I would take it with a grain of salt. Yes, I guess so. But in the end, the the recent NSA scandal revealed that Angela Merkel's phone had been bugged by the US. And that led to a committee within the Bundestag to investigate the claims revealed in Edward Snowden's documents. But with this latest revelation, is the German government being hypocritical? Now for this week's news in brief. Authorities in Frankfurt cancelled a local cycling race after finding a pipe bomb and weapons in the apartment of local Islamists. Two suspects, a 35-year-old German and his 34-year-old Turkish wife, were arrested in the early hours of Thursday morning on suspicion of planning an attack. A homemade bomb was found alongside parts of a G3 machine gun and ammunition. The couple is said to have a Salafist background, a movement that has been under watch by authorities for a longer period of time. Friday was International Workers' Day. The 1st of May has a long history of protests around the world, including in Germany. Unusually, in Berlin, the gatherings were mostly peaceful. 40,000 people gathered for street festivals. Later, there was a traditional protest march. There was a record low of injuries to police officers. However, in Hamburg, two separate violent rallies by radical leftists had to be dispersed by police using water cannons. Focus of the protests across the country were the issues of rights for refugees and the minimum wage. 5,000 members of the labor union Verdi stopped work on Saturday after imposing a strike on Deutsche Post. Two million letters and 40,000 parcels went undelivered, the company claimed. Strikers voiced anger at the postal company's plan to expand using lower-paid workers. The former state-owned postal service business is the largest of its kind in the world. It recently announced plans to boost staff numbers by 10,000. However, Deutsche Post said this would require a reduction in pay to remain competitive. Verdi has demanded a reduction in working hours for the same wage. The negotiations will continue on May 8th. In other news, the train drivers' union, GDL, is planning a six-day strike which is unprecedented in German rail history. It's the eighth protest in dispute with Deutsche Bahn over the pay and conditions. 5.5 million passengers a day could be affected by the strike. And that's the news in brief. If you'd like a quick and simple way to keep up with the latest from Germany... Sign up to our bi-weekly newsletter, which you can find on our website, thisweekingermany.de. 
And now, joining us for our film club, I have a special guest. Hello, special guest. Hello, Daniel. Oh, it's Malachi. Hello, Malachi. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> You're welcome. So what films are we going to look at today? Today we're going to look at German favorites Der Schuh des Manitou and Traumschiff Surprise. So you say that they're favorites. How favorite are they? Well, Daniel, they are the number one and number two films in Germany, German films in Germany of all time, respectively. And I was very shocked by this because, in my opinion, spoiler alert, they're not very good. Let's start with uh, Schuh des Manitou. Could you maybe summarize what it's about? Yeah, it's about... Uh, bunch of indians that act like flamboyant idiots okay uh, but it's supposed to be a send-up of the Karl my um tr german tradition of cowboys and indians westerns and it's supposed to be like a hilarious comedy um spoof on that genre and it's just a lazy incompetently made um unfunny train wreck okay well let's listen to a clip and then we'll uh find out whether you like it or not <laughs> Aber Hachi, mein Bruder. Oh, oh. Dunkle Wolken ziehen auf über dem Land, wo die Schoschonien schön wohnen. Los, mein Gott! Jetzt lassen heute mal ausreden, du Arschloch. <lacht> immer dieses alberne Geschrei und immer bum 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 und Pfeile und schießen und so laut. Soll ich sie noch einmal ablenken? Oh. Der Schuh des Manitou. So, tell me a bit more about the parts of the film that you liked or didn't like. Parts of the film I liked? There was nothing. Any parts of the film you liked? No, to be honest. But what parts didn't you like? All of it, from the beginning to the end. Well, what? Maybe you could mention them specifically. Okay, so there's a scene where you can see this on YouTube, dear listener, if that's what you're into. Um, a scene where they're sort of basically there's a there's a training training. Sequence. There's a twins. There's these identical twin Indians. They're both everyone in the movie is an idiot, but this one particular twin is an, is a particular idiot. And what makes him so hilarious, Daniel, is that he dresses in pink instead of regular brown Indian clothes, and he acts really flamboyantly and kind of girlishly. And what's funny about that is that he's that it's uh, emasculating, and um, that a man would ever act this way, especially an Indian man in the Wild West is what makes this hilarious. So I wouldn't go as far as to say that it was homophobic because it doesn't specifically mention his sexuality, but it does work on these typical homophobic stereotypes. This idea of um, there being a flamboyant man who's actually seen as lesser because he acts a bit like a woman. Now, okay, I mean, it's not as if this joke should be banned or anything like that, whatever. I mean, you can you can do something creative or clever or funny with that but it, it it doesn't have anything redeeming about it this joke it seems to be that it's just okay imagine you take this this indian right but like make him flamboyant and feminine um and that's the joke that there's there's nothing deeper to it which is quite disappointing it's like funny voices silly walks and silly expressions but that's as far as it goes didn't blazing saddles do that yeah but blazing saddles was at least partially a a comment on or a satire of uh, or com commentary on racism and um, like to a small degree. But and, and the jokes were at least clever. This is just if you thought here's what it is. If you thought if you go into a classroom full of six year olds and whatever, whoever the class clown of that particular class is um, with his fart jokes and his hilarious voices makes you uncontrollably stop. You can't stop laughing if, if that just cracks you up then this movie is for you. But it's really popular among... Um, Everybody in Germany. It's the most popular movie in Germany it's, ever. Yeah, the mo most, it's the, the most watched film um, in Germany. It's and, Germany's Avatar. But uh, that's an awful thing to say, but I think it's... There's, 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 yeah. Both have terrible stereotypes of Native Americans. <laughs> yeah. You can see why it's so hilariously... Oh. But it's... Uh, I read one review of the film which seemed quite accurate to me. It said that while normally parodies take clichés from other films and make fun of them, this just makes its own clichés. It takes the other clichés and then adds its own just gaggy clichés on top of them. Yeah, it, it just, just repeats them. It just repeats then... the cliché for humorous purposes. Yeah. So, are if you... that's worth something to you, go ahead and watch this movie. Are you a fan of this film? Not really, Daniel. Okay, so let's move on to the next film, which is called... 
Traumschiff Surprise, made by the same people, starring the same people, with exactly the same sense of humor, plus Till Schweiger. Let's listen to a clip. Okay, ladies, you have now the opportunity to buy a new product. Has anyone lust on music? Klar. Hi, 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 to die. Space taxi to the sky. Hi, 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 to die. Space taxi to the sky. Come on, Feuer Salamander. So high. Mach Beine auseinander. Check it out. Mach Beine bitte zu. Juhu. Und reiß bis du. Oh. Hi, 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 to die. What do you think of Traumschiff Surprise? It even has, they even at one point go back in time to the Wild West and meet some of the same characters that are in Shooter's Manitou. It's like if you couldn't get enough of Shooter's Manitou, which runs it, how long, how long does that movie run? Long. For? Too long. There's more of that in this movie. It's quite disappointing, isn't it? It's exactly the same movie. It is exactly the same movie. It is exactly the same repeat offender of all of the same things that make it terrible. It's just lazy. That's what bothers me. Actually, that, and that wouldn't even bother me if this wasn't the most popular movie ever made in Germany. Well, this one's the second most popular. Right. I just couldn't, That's you know, the only redeeming quality about it. You can't it. capture that lightning in a bottle from the first moon. <laughs> well, the core joke in this film is, again, the effeminate stereotype. And that's it. That's, that's the, and they that's the just whole joke. Use... At one point, they put Till Schweiger in like a pink uh, suit of armor like from the Middle Ages with hearts and flowers. And the joke seems to be... Um, here's a guy who's known for being manly, but he's wearing something that's not manly. And that makes him look silly. Like, they, there could be something in that, <laughs> but that's it. That There's nothing extra, there's nothing behind it. They're not saying something about society. Like, they could have made it somehow intelligent, satire, or whatever, but it is just that. That is, that is it. It's like... Ha ha, these people are acting effeminately. And I, it doesn't make me like angry because it works on stereotypes, but it's just lazy. It's just, there's, no, there's nothing behind it. And, and again, all of that would be fine. And that movie can have, like, I have nothing against bad movies, bad comedy. Um, they have their place in society. But do they have their place on the top? Are, do, do these filmmakers deserve to be the richest German filmmakers of all time? No. No. Then I do have a question. Some people, you know, would wrongly say, yeah, well, German humor, the Germans are not well known for their humor. And I, I don't like this kind of attitude. No. Have, have there been good German comedy films? Yeah, I think Goodbye Lenin is an excellent German comedy. I yeah. think uh, it's, it's subtle, which is the good thing. It's not trying to hit you with, you know, lame gags every second. No, it's just good comedy. Mm -hmm. And... I think Loyo is a famous uh, comedian, a German comedian from like biggest in the seventies and eighties. But I think he's, he's great. genuinely funny. Yeah, he's, he, I don't know if he made films, but he certainly. I think I think he made films. I, I haven't seen them, but certainly on television, he was huge, and he's very good in the sense that that people respect Monty Python these days. Yeah, and it's not even that he's. It's, it's not only that he's good; he's also over the top in the way that these films want to be funny in that way, but they're just not. Okay, and how would you rate Traumschiff Surprise? On a scale of what? Of good to bad. Bad. <laughs> it's like minus bad, like less, worse it's than not, bad. It's, I challenge any of you listening to get through the entire trailer. Go try to finish the trailer of either of these films. You won't be able to because it's so dumb. You will literally die before it happens. But this, we should say, although we b hated both of these films, they're not representative of German cinema <laughs> Um, we 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 reviewed some great, some very good films on this, um, on, in this segment. So yeah, we just thought it'd be fun to do something different, and also because they're the most popular ones, surprisingly. Yeah, number one and two of all time. Not just not just German comedies, German films. films. Yeah, says a lot, I guess. Anyway, what film would you like to review next time? We're going to take a look at the classic German film Fritz by Fritz Lang M. From 1931, right? Right. Bet you surprised at my film knowledge there. Yeah, it's a classic, and we're going to watch that for June's Film Club. Coming up right now, Destination Germany. 
We are taking you on a journey to somewhere in the country which is well worth a visit. Whether you're a tourist or a permanent resident, a foreigner or a German citizen, here we will be covering the famous sites as well as the little known corners of Deutschland. All that matters is showing you that Germany is an interesting and exciting place to visit. If you enjoy the destinations every week we talk about, check out the website thisweekingermany.de where we will have some photos of this week's destination. And joining us on the line now is our surprise guest. Guess who? It's Rob! Hey there, everybody! Good to be here. Hi! How are you doing? You're on holiday, <laughs> right? Is that, it, uh, here all the way uh, from, from America, where I'm on vacation. How, how is the weather there in America on vacation? Beautiful down here in sunny Georgia. That sounds amazing. Actually, we're recording this in advance, I should say, just for um, news, <laughs> news uh, very, uh, uh, truth purposes. I just have to say that. But yeah, I'm glad you're enjoying your holiday at the moment. That's really good. <laughs> so anyway, last time on the program, we talked about the Snow Dome, which is located in Bis Bispingen. How do you pronounce that? Bispingen. Bispingen. Yes, in Bispingen. In case you didn't hear it or in case you forgot or whatever, the Snow Dome is a year-round building which is filled with snow. So in this building, year-round, it's filled with snow. You can go skiing in June or snowboarding in Jul July or have a snowball fight in August. The Snow Dome makes it possible right here in Germany. That was pretty cool, if you don't mind that pun. So where are we going to go this week, Rob? Well, this week we're going down to the state of Baden-Württemberg, and but to its northern edge. Our destination is in the city of Mannheim, and specifically we're going to the Technoseum. Technoseum. What is that? Like a museum for techno music? <laughs> <laughs> no, but funny you should say that because Frankfurt is getting a museum that is dedicated to techno music, which I will be sure to cover later. So no, the Technoseum in Mannheim is a museum that covers industrialism with a focus on the industrialization of the southwest of Germany. That's very interesting, specific, specifically because of the really catchy modern name. Like it's like, hey, like I sound like a club that you can go to, like a <laughs> fancy place. I think they wanted to spruce it up a bit because before it was called the State Museum for Technology and Work. Ooh, <laughs> I, I like Technoseum so much better than that. It sounds much cooler. Well, let us and the listeners know why you chose this museum devoted to industrialization as our destination this week. What does the Technoseum offer visitors? Okay, let me tell you a little bit about the permanent exhibition. They have a huge 8,000 square meter showroom to display engineering and social history of, industrial, of the Industrial Revolution. Visitors can learn about technical, social, and political changes through the 18th century, or since the 18th century. And what kinds of themes can we expect to see in terms of industrial exhibits? You'll get to see how things work like watches and clocks, paper making, fabric production, energy building, mobility, and even bionics throughout the past 200 years. Oh, and before I forget, uh, something that I think is also really interesting is they have a great train experience. So if you like to see how railways are built and how steam locomotives have gone through the ages, then you check out the trains exhibition. Hey, I like what I'm hearing. I bet a lot of people really like to see how things work. This technology museum sounds exciting. You're going to like it even more, and it's going to sound even more exciting when I tell you that there are over a hundred different interactive displays that you can also try. <gasps> yeah, so aside just learning how things work, you can actually <laughs> test them out with your hands. Yeah, with, with your actual real hands, not anyone else's. Um, <laughs> so I don't know, maybe you've been talk robot hands. <laughs> Well, you did say bionics, and I'm thinking, wow, Victorian <laughs> robots from the Industrial Revolution. Okay, well, maybe it's not that, but you've been talking about their permanent exhibition. I guess they have some kind of special exhibitions as well, right? Yeah, in the past, they've had things like nanotechnology, con energy conservation, and the industrialization of food. But right now, until mid-June, the Technoseum has a special showing about the future of medical technology with over 700 exhibits. See what sorts of medicines and technology will be helping us maintain our health in the upcoming years. Well, wow. out of all the types of exhibits that you have seen, what do you think looks the best? I think a lot of the stuff looks really good. I really like the medicine and trains, but what I thought was extremely cool was the bionics section. And where there's bionics, it's pretty big, so there's a lot of things that bionics covers. And it also covers robots. And this museum just happens to have a humanoid one that puts on a great display for the visitors. All in all, for the price of eight euros, or less for students in some other categories, you can spend a great day learning about the history and 
of the technical revolution and what we think uh, technology will be like in the future. Yeah, it all sounds really cool. And so if you want to see all about this, you can have a look at the full article and the pictures on our website, thisweekingermany.de. Rob, when will we hear from you again? You're away. Um, I, I think I can make a special appearance next week as well. Okay, so see you next week. And now we're going to move on to our German of the Week. In this section, we put a spotlight on a prominent person from this week's news, a German citizen or even a foreigner who we deem an honorary German, who's had an effect, for better or worse, on German culture, society or politics. Our German of the Week this episode is Thomas de Maizière, who is currently Germany's Minister of the Interior. This week he's back in the public debate after the latest in a list of NSA spying revelations. It's not the first time he's had responsibility in government, He's also been Minister of Defense and, before that, Minister for Special Affairs. In this role, he officially held oversight of the Bundesnachrichtendienst as well as other German spy agencies. He's held all these positions under Chancellor Merkel. The 61-year-old politician is known to be a close confidant of her and held ministerial positions since her administration began in 2005. He joined the center-right Christian Democrats in the early 70s. After studying law and history, he gained a doctorate in law in 1986. His political career gained momentum when he was part of the West German negotiations on reunification with the East. Here he started working with Angela Merkel, who was a rising political figure from the former East Germany. It was in 2005, with the election of Merkel as Chancellor, when he claimed his first ministerial positions on the federal level. That position, Special Affairs, is what's causing him so much trouble over the latest spying scandal. How much did he know? And if he didn't know, why not? Did he turn a blind eye to NSA meddling? Was there anything else he didn't see? Whatever the answer, he's managed to see of more than one political crisis before. And that brings us to the end of episode number 70. We put a ton of work into this week's episode, hours and hours of our free time. I think you've realized that, Felix, for the first time. I, I sure have. I, I sure have. I can actually see now how much work it is that you and Rob put into this for, like, 70 shows now. Yeah, and do you know what you can do to support This Week in Germany? Share it. Tell your friends, like our Facebook posts, retweet our messages, subscribe in iTunes, and get the word out there. All our social media links are on our website, thisweekingermany.de. This Week in Germany is produced by me, Daniel Winter. It is written and presented by myself, Felix Betzin, and Rob Bishop. We'd like to thank Malachi Ray Rampin for discussing the films Der Schuh des Manitou and Traumschiff Surprise. If you'd like to find out more about his film work, check out mmrampin.com. Also remember, every Tuesday you can now listen to us at detector.fm. Thank you for listening. We'll be back next Monday with more of This Week in Germany.